Good evening. Welcome to the 2019 lecture of the International African Institute. This is the first lecture following the trustees and council members' unanimous decision to rename the Lugard Lecture. The Institute's lecture is now called the International African Institute Biennial Lecture. My name is Alcinda Honwana. I'm the chair of the Institute, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening our 2019 biennial lecturer, Professor Fatou So. I'm here to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Fatuso is a pioneer of gender studies in the continent and part of the first generation of African women researchers who gave voice not only to African issues, but also to African women's emancipation and participation in academy. And it is because of women like Fatuso that African female scholars like myself gain the confidence to join the academy and add our voices and perspectives to scholarly debates. Indeed, her generation paved the way for female scholarship in the continent. Merci, cher Fatou, pour ta contribution généreuse. Fatuso was born in Dakar, Senegal. When she started her university studies in the early 1960s, there were only two African women in the first year at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Dakar. It was herself and another young woman from Beni, Daome at the time. Fatuso finished her baccalaureate in science and psychology and got a scholarship to pursue a doctorate in sociology at Université Paris-Sorbonne in France, where she complete, which she completed in 1969. Back in Dakar, she became a lecturer at University Sheikh Anta Diop, teaching sociology and gender studies. While at Sheikh Anta Diop, she branched out from her previous work on civil servants and introduced a new course on women in African culture, focusing on gender relations. The move raised a few eyebrows among some colleagues at the university, as well as some officials who had, quote unquote, difficulties placing her course in the curriculum. During this period, Fatuso published her first series of essays addressing issues of women and development in Africa. She was invited to join the National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS, in Paris as a research fellow, and this was a position she kept for 30 years. She also became researcher at Université uh, Paris 7 Diderot, working with Catherine Cochry-Vidrovitch in the program Society in Development in Space and Time. And it is at Paris Diderot that she defended her research director habilitation. In the late 1980s, she spent time in the US at the Ohio, Ohio Wesleyan University teaching a course on African women and also engaging with gender studies scholars at the Women's Studies Department. 
This represented a pivotal moment in her trajectory as she became exposed to specific thematic fields, interdisciplinary approaches and debates on the study of women. And this visiting professorship helped consolidate her career as a feminist and gender studies scholar. Professor So's commitment to scholarship in the continent has been apparent on her active engagement as a researcher at CODESIA, Council for Development of Social Science Research in Africa. And in 1994, with Amina Mama and Aisha Imam, she established the CODESIA Gender Institute, which became one of the strong pillars of the Council's program. Throughout her career, through her research, writings, and interventions, Professor So contributed to anchor the questions of gender in African research institutions and universities, as well as more globally. She uses feminist critique to understand and analyze the situation of women in the past, present, and future. And she sees secularism as central to women's movements because of the way religion and culture shape women's status and rights. Her research and thinking is present in her various publications, which include, among others, Engendering, social sciences, uh, Engendering African Social Sciences, co-edited with Amina Mama and Aisha Imam, or Our Bodies, Our Health, Women's Sexuality and Health in Sub-Saharan Africa, co-edited with Kudu Bop, or feminist research in Francophone Africa, or even gender and fundamentalisms. In March 2017, Professor So was celebrated as a leading researcher and feminist scholar in a special tribute organized by Codesria in Dakar, consisting of a roundtable discussion under the theme, Gender on All Fronts, a tribute to Fatou So. But Professor So has also been a dedicated activist on women's rights in Africa. She was the president of the Research Network for Health and Reproduction in Francophone Africa, as well as one of the coordinators of the network Development with Women, with women for a New Era, known as DAWN. She has been an international coordinator for women living under Muslim laws, a global solidarity network which provides information, support, and collective space for women whose lives are shaped, conditioned, and governed by laws and customs derived from Islam. Professor So is concerned about the contested political use of Islam as a tool for power in which women's bodies often become sites of struggle between political forces. Professor Fatuso continued intellectual engagement in women's movements and networks is contributing to curtail the backlash against basic principles of equality and women's rights. This is particularly important today as growing religious, ethnic, and cultural prejudices are still capturing popular and political imagination and continue to undermine progress on women's rights. As she recently pointed out, and I quote, in the African context, we still have much to do to ensure that inequalities do not remain a religious and social dictate. We need to make strides in our analytical and writing capacity to ensure that across generations we are able to build and disseminate a repository of our thinking, actions, reflections, and discourses." End quote.
But on a personal level, she also added, and I quote again, in my own life, I tenaciously fight prejudices and inculcate feminist principles in my children. I draw my inspiration from the solidarity and company of other feminist sisters and from the key principles of honesty and modesty." End of quote. So, colleagues, it is my honor to present you Professor Fatou So. Bonsoir. Thank you very much for this invitation. I feel very proud uh, to be attending and delivering the keynote lecture. Thank you very much to the International African Institute for the members for co-opting me. Thank you, Odile. Thank you, Alcinda. I was wondering to whom are you, are you talking about? <laughs> but I should confess, je suis tellement heureuse d'avoir une assembly aussi mixte et d'être entourée par deux femmes. Vraiment. <laughs> we made progress. A lot of progress. Now let's come to, to the lecture I am delivering. The title of the lecture is The Representation of Women and Claims to Citizens' Rights in Africa Beyond a Political Debate. By way of introduction, I have few questions, and I raise a lot of questions. Not having the answers, at least I can raise them. Representations of female identity are extremely important because they frame women's individual stories as their claims for social and cultural rights, for sexual and reproductive rights, for economic and political rights. Those rights are the most common. So two questions arise. The first one, how to be a woman claiming rights and freedoms and remain African. In contemporary societies where the identity values forged by our own long histories have undergone profound changes as a result, most notably, of colonization, decolonization, and globalization. <coughs> Secondly, how to build one's identity freely and assume it equally freely when norms and rules are so entrenched in culture, religion, and politics and are primarily about social, societal control over individual and groups in general and over women in particular. It is a complex process which can weaken those women whose actions are questioned, condemned in the name of those sacrosanct norms. Thus, women's struggles do not fall only within the sociopolitical debate on gender relations, a debate which could be seen almost easy to engage in. African quest for more equality social justice, and effective citizen rights are confronted with different revitalizations which are in competition with one another. One, the first most, the most criticized Western models inherited from colonization and globalization. You act to up to summarize the idea. And then, you have the reasserted African civilizational and ideological values. You must stay African. And thirdly, the religious values that are reclaimed as cultural resources and identity alibis. African women are constantly challenged 
and what is considered as a Western approach in their outlook and aspirations. Whenever they oppose, that we oppose, cultural injustices, their legitimacy is assessed by the degree of our Africanness. We are challenged on the region's identities, which are almost never to be questioned. Now, how can we elaborate a more relevant approach or more relevant approaches that are acceptable to us and can help us to understand the issues that affect us? The answer is far from simple. Academic research, like many forms of action research or pure activism, is faced with a whirlwind of ideas about the way empirical data should be collected, read, sorted out, and analyzed. Drawing conclusion is just as complex. I have experienced this whirlwind throughout my academic career and during my field work. I have faced this complexity especially with regard to women's issues, with more or less happiness, anxiety, or suffering, depending on the circumstances, the time and place where I was speaking and working. I believe that most of us have experienced this. I will attempt to briefly clarify my position as an African feminist, a position which is subject to various categories on the African continent. I am an African feminist. Rooted in a continent which is deeply steeped in this culture. And I do avail myself of the right to read and reread the pages these cultures have produced and to draw past and present stories from them. I want to be able to question their shifting values because those cultures are alive to analyze their realities, transformations, and contradictions. Should I not appraise their multifaceted contribution to universality in relation to time and space in order to imagine, if not dream, their future? Our cultures are not only memories of struggles against the colonial West, the dominating West, our cultures are also our memories and life spaces, which we reinvent every day, at every moment, with every generation. Our cultures are the fruit of our actions and constructions, deconstructions and reconstructions, conquests and defeats. We need to know them and revisit them using the critical analytical tool that have been developed over time. When asked for a title that encapsulates the essence of, talk, of this talk, I suggested the, the title, Representation of Women and Claim to Citizenship. As women, we are constantly represented against, according to cultural, religious, and political ideologies. Ideology meaning system of ideas, which imagine us, fantasize us, or criticize us, be it as individual or collective icons. It is up to us whether we succumb to this representation and assume them it's up to us to claim, to claim them or challenge them. All those representations constitute as many stakes and challenges in claiming our rights as citizens. We shall see now how. About identity, because this is identity we are challenged, which is a social contract, but I said, in fabrication social. That is a fabric made up by people, made up by men, made up by society. But what is identity? This is a question which is widely debated among academics, politicians, and activists in the religious and cultural spheres, as is the case today. Let me just highlight one or two ideas. In his book, The Power of Identity, 
Manuel Castells, a professor of sociology, defined identity as a marking by religion, culture, or any other determinant of any individual or community to allow them to live in society. For Castells, it is essentially a social construct, which is, and I quote, a source of meaning and experience. Identity, as you understand it, is, and I quote again, the process of construction of meaning on the basis of a cultural attribute or a related set of cultural attributes that is given priority over other sources of meaning. For a given individual or for a collective actor, there may be a plurality of identities, yet such identity is such plurality is the source of stress and contradiction in both self-representation and social action. End of quote. So the relationship between gender and identity is linked to the history of the inter interaction between biology and culture, which I will not discuss at length here, of course, except to say that the biological sex merely allows individuals to perform so-called natural functions. Beyond the biological, being a woman implies gender-based assignations. Assuming a female identity as opposed to a male identity within the family and in society. Through those assignations, human relations are based on a set of attitudes and behavior which are represented, if not caricatures as sign of weakness or strength, on the basis of imagined criteria which are themselves ritualized into models and values. Again, we can gather ample evidence of this both in popular literature, sayings, stories, tales, proverbs, and in scholarly literature. This leads to some other questions. How can we study the processes of construction of identities and their categories? How can we dismantle the positioning mechanisms in the social hierarchies as they exist between the elderly and the young, Lizine Elikade? How can we document the multiple processes of domination, submission, their justifications, their institutionalization in social, political, economic systems. This identity assignation, like gender, age, class, language, religion, ethnicity, race, various roles and status, all culturally and religiously endorsed, depending on their logic, one could say intersectionality, all those organizations assignations determine the standard and rules of representation that can be sources of discrimination, stigmatization, prescription, injunction, etc. So while women and their movements have long lived and suffered the consequences of this organization, one can now witness a multiple intensification of challenges to and rejection of the sexual division of social status and rules almost everywhere in the world. Women claims as citizens generally question this representation of female identity with beyond politics pose clear social challenges. What kind of society do we want? Are we going to pursue? Are we going to pursue? I don't want to put I don't want to put water on my pages in English. It'd be a catastrophe. So, are we going to pursue models prescribed by? the social codes in force, which we try to negotiate or reimagine according to our aspirations? 
So we need to confront the representation of identity. To claim something is to confront it. It is to refuse to abide by the norms, rules, and decisions created and imposed by the cultural, political, moral, or religious orders which vary according to our context. How can we achieve this? Feminism is one way of challenging these orders, the representations of the social roles assigned to gender, and the resulting inequalities suffered by women. It allows us to analyze one's condition and to deconstruct the mechanism of gender inequality. To be a feminist is to want to change these power relations, to promote equality in law, to encourage equal access to citizens' rights for everyone. Feminism, I should say feminism, feminisms, are theorized to, various, to varying degrees the centrality of the oppression of women. It sees sexism as the reason why women are oppressed, marginalized, made invisible, or even excluded. Feminist activists have taken a different approach to explaining the causes, forms, and acts of sexism, and the changes that have occurred in the course of history, and use a different language to understand and describe them. But gender concepts have helped us to reflect about power relations, gender power relations, or relations between sexes. All these theorization show that and I quote, I mean, a mama, the term feminism covers a diverse array of politics centered around the pursuit of more equitable gender relations. This is true of feminism, end of quote. I'm sure that many of you know, I mean, a mama, who is a Nigerian sociologist whose team publishes Feminist Africa, a website hosted by the University of Cape Town. And I, I quote again, Amina. She says, proper documentation and analysis of the various manifestations of feminism and the way these have changed over time in different African contexts is hampered by the lack of access to resources and the limited opportunities for debate, networking, and scholarship grounded in continental contexts. As a result, the debate around African feminism and feminism in Africa remains highly contested and difficult to define." End of quote. At this point, I would like to introduce some African perspectives about the place of women in culture, even if these perspectives have brought as many divisions as contrib contribution to the debate. They continue to fuel controversies regardless whether they relate to methodological, historical, or political issues. The perspective of Western feminists on the, into brackets, global issue of women with the emergence of women's liberation movement and various conceptualization of third world women, such as women and development, gender and development, between 1970 and 2000, have been widely debated by activists from other parts of the world, grouped together as the South, opposed to the North. Dominant, though dominant, these perspectives were perceived as arrogant because they had an allegedly universality approach to the priorities, demands, and strategies of struggle of other women. As such, they attracted very strong criticism. In the US, we have witnessed the reaction of black feminism, which deplored the fact that the question of race and the history of slavery were not taken into account in American feminist studies. And as Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality, wrote, and I, and I quote, because of their international intersectional identity as both women and people of color, 
within these courses that are shaped to respond to one or the other, the interests and experiences of women of color are frequently marginalized within sexism and racism. So it is in a similar context that sub-Saharan debates have highlighted epistemological concerns regarding the relevance of feminist concept and analysis. Decolonizing the social sciences and feminist sciences in Africa has no small, was no small task. And I think of A words, this is the Af Association of African Women uh, for Development, Research and Development, uh, uh, founded in 1977. On another path, Kiru. Degu, the founder, founder and director of Gender, a journal of culture and African women's studies, explained the founding of the journal. She writes, the founding was, and I quote, the founding was guided by two main objectives. The first is to create a space from which to theorize our experiences presently marginalized in today's global context of unequal economic relations. And the second is to wrest ourselves from the mold of stereotypical assumptions in which this international economic order and its attended culture of hierarchy have cast us. This was in 2001. So my question now is how to reflect on the place of women in African culture and history. Breaking the myth of emancipation of women, often described as a benefit, token benefit, of urban colonization, was the first mission of all women involved in any reflection and action, or action on these issues. Scholars in Africa had to identify and take into account the continent's own histories and values. And this was precisely the aim of the symposium sur alors la civilisation de la femme dans la tradition africaine, organized by Présence Africaine. The English title would be The Civilization of Women in the African Tradition. It took place in Abidjan in 1975. Thinkers, both men and women, looked into African women's status and powers, whose origin could be found in the matriarchal system. The debate on matriarchy as a universal system of the organization, organization are not new, of course. For Johan Bachofen, the well-known Swiss theorist of matriarchy, the maternal rights, and I quote, the maternal rights belongs to a more civilized a more ancient civilization than the paternal right. But there was an universal shift from matriarchy to patriarchy. Now, matriarchy being the, the delayed, retarded one, and moving toward progress, this is a patriarchy. So, Shahanda Job, the well known historian of African civilization, however, takes the counterpoint of this theory, which implies the superiority of patriarchy. And I quote, patriarchy synonymous with spiritual yearning towards the divine regions of the sky with purity and moral chastity. And this over matriarchy characterized, according to Sherat Job, a passive dependence on earthly life, material things, and bodily needs. In fact, and I make a long story short, Shahada Job argues that both systems exist in the world. And I quote, these two systems encountered one another and even disputed with each other different human societies, that in certain places they were superimposed on each or even existed side by side. The presence of matriarchy as a basic social institution attests to the profound cultural unity of Africa. And then 
uh, Job goes on and says, writes, Maturaki is not an absolute and cynical triumph of women over men. It is an harmonious dualism, an association accepted by both sexes, the better to build sedentary society, where each and everyone could freely develop by following the activity best suited to his or her philosophical nature. A matriarchal regime, far from being imposed on men by circumstances independent of his will, is accepted and defended by him." End of quote. Of course, several theoretical approaches have been built on the importance of matriarchy and have highlighted the cultural specificities of African women in this context. I'm going to just quote two, three people's work. It's um, about Ifi Amadjoumé, that of course all of you know, in her books in 1987, 1990, and 1997. And of course, Oyoronke Oyowumi in 1977, or uh, Salyu Kanji and Fatukine Kamara in their book in 2000. Just to name a few of the most renowned scholars, all the main ideas or the seeds of these ideas were already present in Shanta's works. If I'm a Jume, I'm a real resuming, a very complex, I will need to put it in a few sentences. If I'm a Jume, was certainly one of the first scholars to agree that the colonial system subordinated women whose political power was inscribed in its organization. She rejects the gender-based nature of political power relations. Then Oyoranke Oyobumi, speaking of the invention of women, making a sense, an African sense of Western gender discourses, did not give any sense to gender as the concept of power relations. For her, it is only in Western culture that the women, into brackets, because of their relationship to their uh, body, is constructed as a category, both in relation and in opposition to men, than in other category. Of course, for Oyewimi, African cultures define your case, not so gender, or body uh, characters of, um, of people, but through social relations. As she says, there is no such thing as a gendered cultural logic. One also may refer, as she says, to seniority, senior junior relations. But for her, the most important factor is motherhood as another basis of women's power because maternity or motherhood is the very foundation of women's identity. For Kanji, Salyu Kanji, and Fatuki Nekama, two Senegalese, the subordination of men is not universal. In antiquity, matriarchal law made gender equality a fundamental value of foreign societies. The woman is the source of life and her power. So African concepts of the body emphasize only biological differences between sexes. And they do not speak of inequality, superiority, and inferiority. Now, Ahmed Jouf, a Senegalese magistrate and linguist, a man. Jimmy Adesina, a Nigerian social scientist, uh, a, sociology, a professor of sociology, a man. And Lewis Gordon, an African-American philosopher of Jamaican origin. All of them share the cult of matriarchy and remind us of its importance in understanding African social facts. Ahmed Jouf, who worked and published on African maternal rights, has highlighted their evolution and their sensitive remnants in contemporary world of culture. Adesina, Jimmy Adesina, a 
and uh, Lewis Gordon. I know all of them and they are friends. They are fascinated by issues surrounding the matriarchy about motherhood. We see an area of research characterized, according to them, by profound epistemologic changes with the appearance of new terms to describe women's sexuality and fertility. So it's uh, motherhood, mothering, matifocality, matricenty, and goes on and on. And in a paper, a very interesting paper, Adesta concludes, finally, and I quote, for African activists and scholars working for gender equity, the words of Amadjoumi and Oyewumi point to the basis for appropriating the useful past from a diversity of African pre-colonial histories. And he quotes Amadjoumi and says, as African feminists, they should seek possible ways out of the historically oppressive patriarchal family structure. Eventing single power, power parenthood and af alternative affective relationships, in the African case, we do not need to invent anything. We already have a history and a legacy of women's culture, a matriarchy based on affective relationship, and this should be given a central place in analysis and social inquiry, end of quote. Now, my question, how do we reread and revisit human cultures using critical, critical analytical tools, progressive development of our time? Of course, social sciences, research, and studies on women have compelled scholars, African scholars, to take part in this broad movement of decolonization, of re-reading and re-appropriating of sociology, culture, and history by African communities themselves. As African women, we needed to re-establish our own histories, our concealed, if not tribalized, cultural specificity. But can't we deconstruct them through new analysis when they come out, they become outdated and out of context? How can women's claim to be granted when they seem to offend the celebrated traditions as we usually call our cultures? You know, when we speak about, about African culture, we always say about tradition. When we speak about the Greek, Spanish, or Latin, or whoever else, we have specific name, but not tradition. The relations of seniority, which according to Oyewumi, dictate relations in African societies, are necessary power relations, whatever sex is. To rule over a family, requires hierarchical relations, which, as the Bibi Baka used of notes, are primarily gender relations. She wrote a very famous paper, Yorubas Don't Do Gender, and asking, don't Yoruba do gender? Question. The need to seek and enjoy more rights has been well understood by women of all backgrounds and has led to many successful campaigns and projects which have resulted in an increasing number of competitive female entrepreneurs. These rights include, among others, the right to access to land and other natural resources, the right to obtain credit without the guarantee of land, which is controlled by men in most of our communities or by the state, the right to political participation and to achieve greater gender parity in political institutions, like city council, for instance. The promotion of compulsory education for all kids, and specifically for girls, and their access to more and more qualified jobs, and the empowerment of women in economic activities. In 2017, women in Senegal made 42% of Senegal of the parliament. This was achieved 
thanks to the soil of the Senegalese Women's Council, which brought together women from civil society and political parties. And owing the support of crowds of women who took the street whenever necessary. Because they were so marginalized in political parties, they constituted the, constitute the body of and they organized the life, you know, those material, not only uh, serving the coffee, but cooking the rice, pot of rice for um, electoral meetings, for instance. If there was no woman, there would be no political parties in, or even not political life. But my women realized that they needed to get together. And coming from the very right to the very left, they came together and, and uh, constituted the COSEF, which is that Senegal Women Council. And of course, when the gender law party was voted in 2010, many people, including some women, are doubted of the competence of women. But they never questioned the competence of 100% male parliament members in the first decades of our parliament. And today, if today we complain about the majority of our parliament, is it the majority of maneuvers of fighting political classes or governance challenges. Reforming the family code has been a long struggle in all countries in West, East, and Southern Africa. In Senegal, in the Senegal, Leopold Seda Senghor, the first president of the republic, managed to impose one unique family code for all Senegalese cities, uh, citizens. You know, Senegal is it's not a Muslim state because we are secular and, and we still want to thank God for being secular. But of course, with the majority of Muslim and with the rise of all uh, Muslim discourses, fundamentalist movements, etc., it was really a challenge. But uh, Senghor was able, because he was uh, clever, but he was all a dictator, as many other, but more clever than the others. <laughs> but he, he was, he imposed, because this is the only word you can use, he imposed one family code. And for instance, there's no more repudiation. You know that in my, society, in my Muslim society, a man can just repudiate his wife. You go, and you have to go. When now, with single, you are obliged to go to court, have a judge decide, for, of course, you have to divorce. There's nothing you can do about it. But they decide who is are the who is um, what do you say? Who has the right to any alimony? I mean, it's just something discussed by the law, not by someone deciding. Okay, you are here today. Fine. Tomorrow, I want you out of my house and my bed. Which is a this is a, and I think it was a beautiful feminist victory for women. But, they, what, but we also have many other feminist achievements in that family code that the minimum age of marriage has been redefined, but still women are not able to make decisions about contraception without the approval of their husband and worse of the marabou or the priest. Because many international organizations like UNFPA have, have campaigned uh, Christian, Christian um, uh, clergy or Muslim leaders, how to find in the Bible or in Quran the acceptance of contraception, as if women were not clever enough to decide what what would control their body and what would control their fertility. It is true that one cannot be a feminist in Africa without identifying first the African sources. You know, we have the outside sources, colonization, globalization, uh, all the bushes, the two bushes, and now uh, the Trump. But once we have said that, we need to dig into our own society. We need to dig about the weight of patriarchy, 
The intersection of gender inequalities and age, class, ethnicity, caste, race, religion, and sexuality. In fact, I had wrote, I had written sexuality and um, sexual orientation. I erase it and put it back. Now it's somewhere in there. Because it's an issue that we don't dare to raise at home when some countries in Africa have taken laws, some authorizing it, as in South Africa, even if it's still complex, and others when it's criminalized. Gender oriented sex, sexual orientation is condemned in the major part of our countries which is an issue that uh, maybe my generation don't want to face, but it will come up. So recognizing and accepting that the body is political is an old feminist claim that has taken into account the need of women as reproductive and sexual rights. As I said, control of their sexuality and fertility, advanced advocacy for the right to abortion, which is still a crime, Prevention of child marriages and forced marriages. Guaranteeing the bodily integrity as abolition of mutilations mutilation and other forms of, uh, of um, attack on women's body. And fight against sexual violence. Criminalization, because it's really not a crime, a crime of rape in society, in families, and in conflicts. You know, when, when, uh, when I hear feminists in the West, and many in France say, a child, when I want, if I want, when I want, with whom I want, each time I say that in a concentrate like this one in Senegal or in other parts of Africa, it is supposed to be shocking. And as a nude woman, I should have that shocking language. Even if I explain that women's control of their own body and fertility should allow them to have that type of speech. Maternity, whether submitted or imposed, has ideological, cultural, and religious meanings we must analyze in a more subtle way and more critically. Because motherhood can be, could, can be a trap for many women in, um, in Africa. And not only the donors who find that African women have too many babies, but ourselves. How do we control? Because by, by the time we have babies, we don't work, we don't go to school, we don't do other things that we need for ourselves and society needs itself. So why it has not been difficult to recognize the weight of external patriarchy, as I said, that of colonization and globalization, we put them now in the same pot. The move to indigenous patriarchy, which is regularly endorsed by culture and region, has been more difficult. All of us, men and women, researchers and others, have have put forward the original matriarchy to glorify our position. We're always saying, yes, we were African women, we had power, we had importance, etc. But if it's around our motherhood, then we need to question that uh, power. Matriarchy is at the root of African society's white children's job. The woman's body is the origin of creation which explain the power and the presence of women in matriarchal societies. We have made matriarchy our matrix of thought, even if there are others along the way. If patriarchy is a politically proven system that raises men to power, does matriarchy follow the same structuring patterns in history? This is a major question for, for us. Isn't it rather a political system based on the uterine transmission of power and assets? This constitutes a huge problem because women are struggling to deconstruct patriarchy 
and its conjunction with other religious colonial patriarchies. This constructing African patriarchal institution uh, has been a challenge that we are grappling with deep-seated identity issues, which men, which women find difficult to question for fear of losing their identity. We could have redefined polygamy, would have redefined the meaning of dowry. We could, in our Muslim societies, discuss about the wearing of Muslim veil, about shaking men's hand as a woman. All those questions are raised in front of us. But there is one last point I would like to highlight. It is the rise of religious and cultural fundamentalisms. And when I say religious, I mean not only local religions, because there are religions, systems, but Islam and Christianity. Uh, because among our radical groups and radical discourses of uh, Islam becoming political, to um, the power of the church, of the Catholic church, or the Protestant church, or going into areas. But all the, the evangelist churches, what they have all over Africa, even in, in the Muslim West Africa, you go to Senegal, you go to Nigeria, you have fundamentalist churches, evan no, evangelical churches. And of course, in Nigeria and southern part of, uh, of Central and Southern Africa, it's um, an issue. So I don't call them radicalism. I call them fundamentalism, but like, because I want to come back to the fundamental principles of what ideologies they claim themselves. So I can't witness their effects on the public space, streets, media, academic on our campuses, and associative spaces. In political life, because political Islam and political church are uh, in uh, our DRC or in some of the parts of Africa are really challenging. If you want a political space, how do you organize it? Because I think we put secularism in danger if you regard, if you go back on so many women's rights which were conquered thanks to many conventions and protocols we have elaborated and not thanks to the holy books and some interpretations of customs. So what a conclusion. I'm almost done now. Can we really have a conclusion? And I put a question mark, because myself, I don't. But I hope that the future, next generation will have some answers to some situation, at least. Of course, human studies have evolved considerably with new theoretical developments. The sociology of the family has also renewed the study of its dynamics in changing patterns of arrangement, discussion, negotiation, or conflictual relations between individuals. African cultures, I want to repeat it, they are also experiencing changing dynamics. When I want people to speak of La Culture Africaine, there's, some, uh, there's a set of several values and they have to be intact because you have to be real African. What is it to be a real African? What is it to have a, an African culture? Because African culture lives at the present time and face many dynamics. So this, those dynamics should be taken into account and analyzed with appropriate critical tools. Should we not visit the African storytellers and poets, the feminine and maternal icon of Mama Africa, L'Afrique Mère, brandished by many of our male interlocutors in response to our discourses? You know, when we have debates with male African colleagues, they'll say, Fat, we are too Western. We are occidental. 
Because they always highlight the powers of their mothers to be our exchanges. My mother did, my mother is, my mother. And when I ask, but, oh, but what about the mothers of your children? And then they, yeah, of course, but you will not quote it. Their mother. And that's true, that the, mid, the, the, the mother in many of my, if, if my constitu constituency is, there's a symbolic of the mother, and you know, your mother is the one who transmits characters, assets, uh, and whatever values. And if you are successful, it's because your mother worked hard. That means she accepted to be beaten, to be uh, mistreated, to be whatever women are complaining about without, without complaining themselves so their kids could be but well, I have the the mother of uh, of the whole of the big uh, shares and the mills and is the way that I remember it uh, mostly. So, Han, how can we better understand the place of many our societies, from the political hierarchy to grassroots communities? when it comes to access to land, to resources, to political power. What is their influence in the face of the many ancient and contemporary forms of a very real and persistent patriarchal power? The debate is far from over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fatuso, for this excellent presentation. And I'm now inviting Odile, Vice Chair of the Institute, to offer a, a word of thanks. Thank you, Alcinda. Uh, English being the language of the day and of the town, I will go on in English. Mais j'indique qu'il y a des traductions ou des versions françaises de la conférence de Fatousso sur cette chaise devant l'estrade pour ceux qui souhaitent en avoir. So, uh, dear Fatou, I would uh, really like to, to thank you warmly in my name as vice uh, chair, but also I guess in the name of everybody here for your brilliant and thought-provoking uh, lecture. My thanks will be short as the tradition goes, but very sincere. I have always wondered why there was a female section in most African political parties. What does this imply for the party as such? Your lecture, by bringing together ideas which are often thought of separately, helps us address this question and reconsider many similar issues. Your title focuses on citizenship and citizen rights, pushing us to consider debating about rights and equality of rights for all citizens as being the basic political question. Among the ideas or concepts you brought together I will only cite a few, a few, you know, which I drew from your very dense uh, lecture, and obviously um, I can't discuss all of them, just a few. You have reconsidered the use of an old-fashioned expression, la condition de la femme, the female condition, which obviously undermines the class and race dimension under discussion all over the world and especially in Africa, under the term of intersectionality and in which black feminism also questions. So this is one important contribution. 
You have also stressed the importance of representation of women, on which so many discourses and practices have been developed over the last centuries, mainly by men. And your lecture reminded me of the provocative essay by Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own. But anthropologists, missionaries, administrators, and more recently, religious leaders, uh, writers, politicians, all have their own ideas about women. This relates to the question of identity, which you also addressed in your lecture, which should be, as you've shown, self-described and not imposed by outsiders. For women, this is particularly relevant as their Africanity is often questioned whenever their ideas seem to convey outside models or as women are easily accused of being westernized and not African. A question which obviously has never been debated, for example, with regard, with regard to the Africanity of Marxism. Finally, do you address the question of gender and gender relationship, which implies not only looking at colonial discriminating policies, but also analyzing more closely African societies. As you pointed out, more research has to be done from this perspective, and a conference like this one already addresses some of the questions you raised. All these questions are fascinating thoughts which we will digest and discuss, each in, a, in her or his own way over dinner or a beer. Enjoy the evening.